All right, so in today's webinar, we are discussing financials. So this kind of has two halves. The first half is focused on invoices and invoicing processes and what you can do with invoices, as well as some configuration for them. The second half has to do um, with chart of accounts and account classes, specifically with two goals. One, uh, getting us to the uh, uh, bank reconciliation screen, i.e. Fin the financial screen, really what it's called, uh, and working with the deposit functionality. And the other half of that is also for QuickBooks Sync. So uh, we're going to start with invoices, which is more the day-to-day -day kind of thing that most people are interested in, and then we'll segue into um, accounts and classes and, and, and uh, deposits and QuickBooks. By the way, the QuickBooks, QuickBooks Sync piece itself is only about five minutes at the very end. Uh, so anybody who may be watching this as a recording who wants to actually just know how to turn on that sync, it's just the last five minutes. It's really, it's really simple. Most of what, though, comes up to that will be needed in order for that sync to work properly. So just keep that in mind. So let's go ahead and get started. So I like to start with the concept of invoices themselves. It's just, well, a concept. Invoices are kind of like receipts. They are transactions. So a lot of times people kind of hear the word invoice and they go, well, we don't send invoices. Everything's paid immediately. So in that regard, invoices are like receipts. But some organizations do use invoices in the more classical sense of um, taking in transactions, recording them, and then sending a bill. But for our purposes, we're going to probably think of them more like when we go to the grocery store. We go to the grocery store, we put items on our bill, and then we pay that bill. Same kind of concept. So the invoice is basically the transaction with its items and payments. So let's th look at how to actually find invoices. Let's start there. So just to see the invoices in your system, we can just click on this button here, which, by the way, this number shows your unpaid invoices, which ideally should be zero, but in my case is not. And we can click on that number, and we're going to find all invoices in the system. So here we see every contact that has an invoice of any kind, and we'll see the number of paid, unpaid, and partially paid. If we click on a given person, so let's just use Acme Corp operation here, we can see their individual invoices, you know, the breakdown, how much money, uh, the individual invoices, we can search for invoices. Uh, with every invoice, we have the date, the number, the number of items on it, uh, the product descriptions is basically the name of the item, so this usually can be anywhere from one to multiple, um, and ability to receive payment and a few other things. Occasionally, you will have empty invoices. I'll talk about how these come about, but they're really easy to get rid of. Just delete them. I'm going to talk a little bit more about deleting invoices later on. So it's a really good idea if you come across an empty invoice, just delete it. That way, your account of unpaid will go down, and it'll be a bit more accurate. So... What can we do with invoices? How do we create invoices? When do they come into play? So every financial transaction within the system will create an invoice, either automatically or you'll create the invoice and add the item to it. So anytime there's money, there's an invoice. As a bit of an aside, in-kind donations, because there's no money, have no invoice. So do keep that in mind. We cover that in a different webinar, uh, but that does sometimes come up in this one. So. How do we create an invoice? How do we add items to it? How do we pay off that invoice? Let's just run through a basic example right now. So we can either from invoices go create invoice, or we can go create invoice from quick add. In a couple other scenarios, it's either made for us, as with add gift, quick add gift, or uh, sometimes it, there's shortcuts that kind of skip some of the steps in here. But we're going to primarily work from invoices itself uh, and not worry about those specifics that are usually covered in things like donations and membership or events. So let's create an invoice for Acme Core here. Corporation, excuse me. Create invoice. Here's our invoice. So by default, the system fills in who the invoice is for, Acme Corporation. Otherwise, if I had said, you know, create invoice from here, I'd have to fill it in at that time. So a bit of a shortcut there. The invoice date, um, this usually should, especially if you're backdating, be also the date that the transactions transpired on. So if you're backdating, say, a donation back from 2015, the invoice date probably should be back in 2015. I'm going to keep everything just with the default, which is today, and be happy. Invoice number, 
this is set by the system. We'll see how the system calculates these. But generally speaking, they're just in integrate. Um, imp it's a word that starts with I. It's totally failing me. Um, whatever. It's just counting up by one each time. I know there's a word for that. and I'm blanking on it. Uh, thank you. It's incrementing up each time. So my next invoice I create will automatically be 4192. So we go ahead and create invoice, and that's our first step. The invoice is now existent. If we leave this screen, that invoice is still existent. It still exists. So, um, you know, that's how we can get empty invoices. So that's how we can get those empty invoices. So be aware of that contingency. And then as we saw, we can delete them easily. Once we have our invoice, we can go ahead and put items on it. The most basic simple scenario is an invoice with a single item and a single payment. So let's run through that example and then we'll see more interesting examples. So your invoice items, is a formal word for it, are basically your transactions, the individual you know, bits of a transaction. And they can be the individual gifts, um, other items, which are a specific, specific type of custom data set, event registrations, or memberships. There can also be event other items, which we're not going to focus on today, but that's another type of invoice item type. So those are, our, I guess those are five, five invoice item types that can exist. Uh, at this time, the only ones that do, memberships, uh, other items, events, event other items and donations. So let's go with something simple. Let's just toss a donation on here. So as with any donation, you know, you put in your details. I'm not going to run through the details of donations. It's a different webinar. So let's just run through that really quickly. So we're just going to general fund. Source is uh, came by mail. 50 bucks. Not going to put anything else. Save. So this adds an invoice item to our invoice. We can click on this invoice item to edit it. By the way, this is true for any invoice item. I can delete the invoice item from the invoice, which basically deletes it from the system, because at this point, it all, it does exist in the system. So it would show at this point in someone's donation information, but it wouldn't show up in donation acknowledgement because there's no payment against it and a few other caveats. But just know that at this point, it does effectively exist. It's on the invoice. So if I delete it, it will remove it from the system and so on. And so we have our invoice, we now have an item on it, and we can now receive payment. So receiving payment basically says this invoice is paid off and we're all done. So um, we'll talk about credit later and outstanding debts. We're not going to bother with that right now. Key in and swipe is used with credit cards. At the moment, just Bluefin. I'm finagling to get that also extended to Stripe, uh, but we'll put that aside for the time being. So mode of payment, you know, something like a check. Date on the date of payment. So this is what's going to recognize. This is the date that will show in your QuickBooks, by the way. And this is the date your accountant's going to use. So that's what date of payment is. Reference number, something like the check number, and the amount is uh, $50, what they paid. And then that should match what's owed over here. Receive payment. So that's our basic scenario. We create an invoice. We add one item to it. We immediately pay it off. So most of your donations memberships, events, will probably run through this scenario. Nothing too exotic is going on here. But let's run through another scenario. Let's say someone has an outstanding debt. No, 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 let's not run through that one yet. Actually, let's just run with the uh, what's called a split transaction. So I'm going to pick a different uh, contact for this one. Let's pick someone who doesn't have uh, so much on their record, and we'll use them. Okay, so let's see here. Okay. Um, Adam Smith here. Let's use him. So we're going to go ahead and create an invoice for him. So just yet another way we can get into it. Create an invoice for today's date. And let's run through this scenario. So let's say we have a case where someone went to an event, paid for the event at the event, and made a donation. So that's not too uncommon. We call that a split transaction. There is a specific variant of it that's covered in another webinar called a split donation. Same concept, but it's specific to donations, but uses the same kind of layout. You're basically just going to add two invoice items to it. So let's start with the event registration. So um, let's see here. We got Toddler Fest coming up. I made that one up. Silly. Um, so Toddler Fest, an event coming up for kids and their parents. And so let's say we're going to buy 
to have two adults, which are five dollars, and one toddler. Save, and then you know we go through the registration process as normal. That adds our registration total of ten dollars, which encompasses both of our uh, actual you know, registrations in one invoice item. And then we're going to add a gift. So they went to Toddler Fest and they made a donation to maybe another maybe fifty bucks, so that uh, so this would be an in person for maybe fifty bucks again. And in this case, you know, it's for Toddler Fest, so we'd actually maybe want to specify. There you go, Toddler Fest. So we want to specify the event, so on and so forth. Put in our our donation details, and we're done. So now we have one invoice with two items on it, and we can now pay it off. So let's do that. Receive payment and put in our payment details. So once again, apparently this person has a credit on their record. So fine, let's actually run with this example. So in this example, we're gonna kind of blend examples here. It turns out this person has an outstanding balance. What that means is they've paid us money at some point, but they did not have a debt on their record that it went against. So we'll ignore how that happened for the time being, because that's gonna be our next example. We're gonna create a, a debt, a, a, a credit. But let's go ahead and use that credit so that we can keep per using this person and kind of zero them out. So we're just going to use that credit. We're not going to you know, actually enter any payment data. And we can just use receive payment. So what it did is it took that 60 bucks, applied it against this invoice, and we're paid out. Now, we could have also done receive payment and put in a new payment if they had actually paid us there and not realized they had credit. You know, Different scenarios depending on the data. But now we have a person who's nice and zeroed out. So let's run with them again. So now if we go back to Adam Smith, I clicked the wrong button. I wanted this down here at the bottom. That's actually going to take me to the contact record. Excuse me. Let's see, can I override that command? I don't think it's going to work. That's all. That did work. Okay. So by clicking on the person's name, it actually would have taken me to the record. But then I clicked the back, but back button uh, down here in the bottom left, which took me back to their invoices just in time to override the uh, browser, what it was going to do. So here we have all of our invoices. So let us create another invoice and um, let's not pay it. So let's, let's, uh, let's leave an outstanding balance. So here everything is paid out. Create invoice, Adam Smith, create for today. And this scenario I will not run with a donation. Donations should never be done in this way. Donations should always be paid immediately. If they are not paid immediately, they are a pledge and should use the pledge entry process, which is not covered in this webinar. So let's in fact use an event. That's often the case where people where this comes up. So let's say um, you know <clears throat> Adam here is going to register some friends for this event, but his friend, but you know he's going to pay for them later. And that's okay with us. It sometimes happens. So he's going to have his friend Steve come with Steve's daughter. And um, he'll pay for Steve later on. Save. So the invoice now exists. We have an item on that invoice. But we can just simply skip receiving the payment. So now if I go back. The invoice exists. The registration is com is in the is in the event, but the amount is unpaid. So now, the contact has a debt on their record. If we go to the record, they now have a ledger balance. Well, they will in the morning, of five dollars, negative five dollars. We'll talk about ledger balances a little bit later. So, how do we handle an outstanding debt? Well, this is very simple. I can simply receive payment against it. I could also receive payment down here, which would pay off any debts because it is theoretically possible for someone to have multiple debts on different invoices, in which case I could actually pay them off together. In fact, let's not do that yet. That gets a bit complicated. Sorry, I'm being a little indecisive today. So many different examples to run through. So let's just pay off this one, and then I'll create two unpaid invoices and pay them out together. So this is a case where we have a single invoice, a single item, and a single debt. We're going to pay them off together. I mean, pay it off by itself, by check, and reference number, $5, all done. Receive payment. Ta-da. OK. So let's create another example. 
let's go ahead and put in an invoice. Oops, that was the wrong button. By the way, if I hit receive payment here without an invoice to pay against, that creates a credit, for example. That would put a payment against the record where, they, where we now owe them money effectively, and we'll later on find that a debt to apply it to. That's not used very commonly, but it can sometimes come up. Um, if you cancel a uh, event registration, for example, that also can create a debt if you want to. Uh, excuse me, a credit, a uh, couple of scenarios. But let's go ahead and create another invoice. I'm going to do this very quickly, so I'm going to run through this. Um, let's do another event. And let's see, let's put a bigger, let's get some more bigger debts on here. Um, there we go. Save. Invalid registration date. Okay, so I'm going to backdate this. Let's backdate this <coughs> a month. That should work. Let's hope that works. Really? Oh, it's not on sale yet. There we go. Registration dates. They're important for events. So I'm going to run through this really quickly. And then I'm just going to not fill in who any of these people are. And um, now I have an unpaid invoice. So I kind of did that a bit dirty, but now I have an unpaid invoice. So let's actually run through another example while we create our next example. What happens if they only partially paid? So if I go receive payment on this invoice, I don't have to pay this full 600. Perhaps they only paid three, and they're going to pay us the rest later, and that's what our next example is going to be. So I can say they only paid 300, and I can say how that 300 is allocated. Now, if I had multiple items, I could say that 300 was paid against this and everything else was zero, or I could have split that 300 against different items, whatever I need to do. That's what this side is. It's called the allocation side. Uh, I guess that's the name. Um, and it's basically how is the money over here going to be distributed? So I'm just going to pay 300, nothing funny in my distribution, receive payment. If, for example, I had only distributed 150 of my 300, that would also create a, a, a credit on the record, but you don't normally do that. Um, so here we have partial paid. Let's put one more invoice in so that we can you know, use that example I was heading towards. So let's do um, another item of retail sales, and they bought a book, which is not a donation. They bought one book for 12 bucks, transaction date, which is what's going to show in their record. And now that is an invoice item um, on the invoice, and our invoice is now unpaid. So my scenario here is, can I pay off two invoices with the same check? The answer is yes. And that's where this receive payment down here tends to come into play. I, oddly enough, I can also do it from here because it's going to, as we saw earlier, pull up those outstanding payments, and I just have to select which ones I plan to do. So it works about the same in both cases. It's just the other one that would have automatically checked one of the options for that invoice that I selected. The other does not. So let's go ahead and just pay off both invoices with one check. So I'm going to select both. I owe $312. They pay by check. Check number 312. So always double check your numbers. Receive payment. And so now what I have is two invoices with one item each paid off with one check. So we can do the whole gambit of uh, you know complexity. We can have uh, one, one invoice with one item with one payment. We can have one invoice with two or more items with one payment. We could even have uh, one invoice with any number of items with any number of payments. And we can also have one payment go against multiple invoices. And various weird combinations are in. So you could have, you know, an invoice that has one payment by itself and then shares a payment with another invoice and whatever you need to do. So reality, whatever comes up, because weird things come up, will be able to be supported by this invoicing system. So um, I think we saw using credit. We haven't created credit. So let's create credit for this person and then you use it. Um, Receive payment if I just, for some whatever reason, they gave me money, I've got no debts, it's going to create a credit balance. I don't feel like actually creating the balance, so actually I'll just show you, but that's what this would do. We have nothing to pay off, 
so a credit balance will be created. And then we can use it like we saw earlier. So that's the basics of invoicing. We actually got that done in good time. Any questions about invoicing? All right, so let's go into invoice configuration and a couple of other odds and ends for invoicing. So one thing I do wanna show, I almost forgot actually, is modifying the payments on invoices. So actually, let's go back to the concept of editing invoices. I almost forgot this. So we saw that we can edit an invoice, edit the items on an invoice, delete the items from an invoice. But we have to remember that payment is also a part of this picture. So if you delete or edit an item on an invoice, you could end up with more payment or less payment than you started than you had when you before you started editing. Because it's so for example, if I delete this donation from here, I'll end up with a um, a credit of fifty dollars. If I was to increase the amount of this donation, I'd end up with an amount due. So we do need to remember that we will need to be able to modify. We need to keep into account the payments against an invoice. So if I need to modify the payment for an invoice, I actually don't do it from the edit screen. I do it by viewing the invoice. And then there's a couple other things that we want to show you on this. So we can edit the payments and the allocations and all that. We can also disassociate a payment. And I'll show you in a little bit how you delete a payment entirely from a contacts record. So if I do this, it actually disassociates the payment from this invoice. I can print and email invoices. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna print this one just to show you what an invoice looks like before we go into editing what they look like. So we'll give it a second to generate the PDF. There we go. PDF, my browser will open it, and this is what our invoice looks like, and we'll see in just a few minutes how we edit these. So we have a lot of information, items, registration details, and our payment information. Close. Okay. So what I want to do at this time is, uh, before we actually go into the layout of invoices, since I brought it up, let's talk about deleting a payment from a contact record. So I'm gonna go to Adam Smith's record. And we're gonna talk about the ledger balance. So at the moment he shouldn't, no, he should have a credit because he had one this, as of this morning. So this is the credit balance he had this morning. This updates every morning, so that's why it hasn't updated yet. Wait for the page to load. Okay, so financial details shows you all transactions and payments against them. Giving details is just donations, keep that in mind. If I click on a ledger balance, it will give me the two ledger balance for the person. So what's two ledger balance? Uh, I don't think that's actually the official term for it, but there's a thing in accounting about having two ledgers, one of debts and one of credits, and that's basically what we have here. On the left, we have all invoice items that they have in their contact record what invoice they're on, and the amounts that they owe, oh, that, uh, that they basically are a credit or a cost for, uh, debit for, and over, a debt for, that's the word. And over here we have all payments, the invoices they've been associated to, and what those payments were for. So this is a $5 payment that was put against this invoice. This is $312 payment put up against two different invoices, and so on and so forth. We can edit these payments, we can delete them. So if you do have a credit on someone's record that should not exist, this is usually the screen I recommend checking out because this is where you can see if there's a discrepancy. For example, a payment with no invoices is loose. It has no assignment and uh, it may not necessarily, you know, it might not necessarily need to be there. It may have been a mistake. So you may consider deleting it. So this is a good screen just kind of the first check if you see ledger balances that don't make sense to see what's going on. And it can also help you find what invoice is that thing on? Uh, or what invoice did that payment get used for? And you can find them here. And then go to the person's record. Okay. So, by the way, very useful tool. We use it all the time in support uh, for helping people figure out why things aren't balanced. So, strongly recommend checking this out. All right. So, putting that aside, editing and deleting payments, let's go into invoice settings and invoice numbers. So, let's start with invoice number. This is pretty straightforward. This is basically how does our numbering system for invoices work. Now, with a fresh system, your invoicing should start at one. 
if you're migrated in, your invoicing will probably start a little higher. Here, I, for my own reasons, I have finagled some stuff and actually had invoicing start at 4001. This is my current invoice number, and I can add prefixes and suffixes, alphanumeric you know, characters at the beginning or end of my invoice numbers for whatever reason. So don't see this used very often, but this is where these settings are. Not too much here. Invoice settings are a much more important um, configuration because this is what your invoices will look like. This is what they're going to look like. Um, <clears throat> sender information when they're emailed uh, from like the public site and various other things. So first off, pick your template. If you ever have a request for a template other than one that we have, go ahead and email support at Fundly.com. If you have an example, like a printed example, you can email us at even better. Um, if it's just some color changes, it's usually pretty easy. If you want a completely different layout, uh, that is where an example would definitely come in handy. Uh, the header is basically this here, and then uh, what's shown up at the top here. So this is part of the header. Uh, I think by default this is going to say invoice, or it might be blank, I can't remember, so you might want to change it to something. Uh, use this the invoice by default. A lot of people didn't would get confused with the word invoice, so I actually recommend we change it to receipt because I think that, especially for donations, it's a little less confusing. Columns, this is what's shown in uh, this section here. So you can slim it down and rename things. Footer, down here at the bottom. And then more is things like account summary. Payment details, I always recommend to keep those. Letterhead paper means that we won't be putting anything up here. And then what will your sender information be if this is emailed out from the public site. So for those people using any sort of public site implementation, uh, both, well, not necessarily, uh, you can get an invoice if you want, if you have it set up, but your person, your donor, what have you, will get, normally get an invoice, strongly recommended. That is basically just, well, the receipt, and um, you might want to set the sender name, sender email, so they can see who it's from, and the subject line. You can also make it so that online gifts do not get an invoice. I don't really recommend this one. Um, because um, because some people don't like both the invoice and the donation acknowledgement to be sent out. Um, I honestly think that both is better because this is more of a balance your checkbook kind of thing. The other one is more of your is your actual IRS letter or whatever your revenue service is for your country. So any questions with invoice configuration because we're basically at the end of invoices. Okay, so I'm going to cover something I uh, oftentimes don't, but I want to make sure that it is covered for those who are interested. Payment gateway providers. So you can, as you may have seen, um, process credit cards in the system. Actually, we didn't really show that too much, but um, of the modes of payment, there is actually one that's credit card. And with that mode of payment credit card and the swiper option I showed at the top, you can actually process a credit card through the system using a payment gateway provider, which is at the current this time Stripe. And with this payment gateway provider, they basically process the credit card, pass back that it succeeded, and re-record the donation. This also means that you can take donations online. So if you're interested in setting up a payment gateway, go to payment gateway settings. Here we can do it from the main menu, payment gateway settings. Yes, leave page. And you will have the ability to begin the application process. Now in my case, I've already set all my stuff up. I'm using an older one called Bluefin, uh, so your settings could be different, but at this time uh, you'll see something like this. So, If you're using Stripe, by the way, this is not valid, so I'm not too worried about keeping it secure. It won't actually process credit cards. That's why I'm showing it. If you're using Stripe, though, we have some really cool new settings under financial settings. And that is the ability to handle multiple currencies. Now, if you're interested in multiple currencies, talk to support. We'll give you more details. It interacts with the system in different ways for different modules. But in short, what you will do is set your home currency and enable multi-currency processing. I can't do that. I'm using a Bluefin account, and it doesn't support uh, multi-currency in the way that, um, that I mean. But it would allow you to set up different prices, say, for memberships or uh, different donation options for donations uh, in different currencies. So, for example, if you have Canadian, if your organization is both in uh, America and uh, Canada, 
then you could have USD and the Canadian dollar supported. And then financial year starting month, this is just you know what your financial year is. This is used elsewhere in the system, but should mention it here. So not going to go too much more into multi-currency processing. Like I said, if that is something you're interested in, let us know. and We can talk to you about that. You will need to use Stripe. Uh, we may have future uh, gateway processes that could also support it, but currently only Stripe does. Um, and at this time, although it could change, so take it with a grain of salt, they are 2.9% plus 30 cent processing fee for Stripe. Um, but like I said, that can change, and sometimes you can get different deals with Stripe uh, if you let them know you're a nonprofit. But you have to work that way with them. It could change. So, what have you. Alrighty. Uh, so, we're now ready to get into the concept of um, a chart of accounts, account class, the financials module itself, and QuickBooks. So I'm going to preface the following with the, with the concept that I'm actually not an expert in QuickBooks. I will not make any any uh, you know claim for that. I will give you some very basic definitions for chart of accounts and classes. It is by no means 100% um, accurate in terms of all the, 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 like the technicals of what they do. Um, but for those not familiar with it, I'm hoping it will give you just kind of a basic sense of what it's used for. If you are interested in chart of accounts and classes, they're, they're true definitions. I would either talk to your CPA or there's some tutorials online or check out, you know, like the QuickBooks um, help materials. So what we're going to do now is move into configuration. So what we're going to do now is we're going to configure chart of accounts and account classes. We're going to apply them to certain types of transactions and basically build a hierarchy of when a certain transaction will get assigned automatically a chart of accounts or an account class. We will then go into the financials module and see where we can manually override for a given transaction, the chart of account or class, and then the two ways in which they're used. The first one being uh, bank reconciliation report, uh, deposits and the other being QuickBooks Online Sync. We do not at this time have a sync with QuickBooks desktop version. We are currently in the process of creating IFF, or is it I, 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 yeah, IFF um, export options, which basically lets you export and import from our system into QuickBooks that's coming, but not currently implemented. So keep that aware. Should be, I think, next month, um, but things can change. So if you're watching this in September, you may already have that option. And um, so putting that aside. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create our chart of accounts. Actually, let's do it backwards. We're going to create our account classes. Then we're going to create our chart of accounts. And then we're going to start setting a hierarchy. So let's start with account classes. But before we start with that, let's give some definitions. What are the chart of accounts and what is an account class? So a chart of accounts for our purposes, we're, we're only concerned with income chart of accounts. We're not worrying about expense or asset chart of accounts. Um, so we're going to put those aside completely. The income chart of accounts for our purposes is what the money is going to. So it's kind of like donor intent, but it's more deep than that. It's on the financial side. So um, we'll talk about that in a second. But it's basically saying for our accounting purposes, so not development purposes, but accounting purposes, where is that money going? So your accountant, CPA, what have you, chances are has created a chart of accounts that had, you know, for their purposes, organizes where your money for your organization is going. Could be things like contributions for donations. It could be things like event registration fees. It could be things like building maintenance. It's actually more of an expense. Excuse me. Uh, it could also be an income and what have you. Uh, from my own personal experience, uh, I've been on HOA boards and things like that. It tends to reconcile with the budget items that we have, is my understanding. So things like that. So chart of accounts is basically where is the money going to go after it's been you know, brought in. Your classes are ways to bridge across chart of accounts. So, for example, I may have a um, money that goes into contributions and other money that goes into uh, event registration. Now, how do I know that, that money all came from a given event? Well, I can configure that event in my chart of my account classes as a class. And I can basically say, OK, this donation goes to contributions and the uh, Mad Hatter Ball 2016 class. And this donation 
excuse me, this event registration money goes into event registrations, but because it also came from Mad Hatter Ball, I put it against the Mad Hatter Ball 2016 class. This means that I can now pull all contributions, all event fees, or all money, either specific to donations or specific for events, or both together for Mad Hatter Ball. And, uh, you know, that just gives us a greater um, flexibility in reporting. For development purpose, fund, a, uh, uh, fund, program, campaign, event, as covered in the donation webinar, has a very similar concept. You can kind of, you know, kind of a Venn diagram of things overlapping. But anyway, that's my rough uh, d description of that. I'm not saying it's 100% accurate, but hopefully it'll be sufficient for our purposes today. So let's get into how to configure these pieces. So let's start with class, of which uh, we will find under financials. Here it is, account classes. So as mentioned, these are your kind of you know account spanning definitions, I guess you could call them categorizations. So these usually correspond to events or campaigns. Now as this is loading up, I do want to put a caveat. Development, as it's sometimes called, and finances, financials are very different worlds, as has been my experience. Financials, your accountant person, you know, they look at money in a very specific, usually very regimented way, um, dictated by accounting principles, IRS requirements, and so on. In development, you know, we're not so worried about the legalities of that money, about how it was actually used, well, we are, but put that aside, not how it's actually used, how, what, you know, what bank account it's going into, how we report it to the IRS. We're more concerned with our relationship with the donor, relationship with the member. So in a lot of ways, development is more about relationships about than it is about the technicalities of the money. So in my experience, development, uh, which is, you know, a person, you know, trying to make people into donors, get better donations, and what have you, looks at things very differently than financial. So a lot of what we're actually about to do is kind of bridge those two worlds. So I'm going to try and give you hints of how those bridge, like I just did, by saying that class kind of, you know, reconciles most closely with campaigns and events, but it's not going to be 100%, so you, you know, your needs of your organization may differ. So just kind of want to put that caveat out there. Um, if you are more primarily a development person, primarily an accounting person, you may have to learn how the other side, you know, looks at the world. If you happen to be both, well, then life could be interesting for you. And you're going to have to keep kind of that compartmentalization in your mind of, you know, when I'm thinking about a chart of accounts, I need to kind of separate myself a little bit from how I record money. Because your board of directors, when they say, tell me about donations, are going to pull the reports from, um, you know, Fundly. When your treasurer says, tell me about what we're, do what we're spending our money on, they're going to your accountant and looking at it very differently. So I think I spent enough time on that, but wanted to give that warning. So back to classes. Very simple to configure. They're what I call a line item configuration. We give our class a code. Uh, I don't think there's a class number system in... Um, uh, QuickBooks, so I don't think this reconciles necessarily to anything in there, so it's whatever system you want. Here we just say class one. So let's do a class two. And then description is the class name in QuickBooks, or the subclass name. So if you do have a subclass, it's part like a subset of Mad Hatter Ball, for example, uh, maybe you do Mad Hatter Ball as the class, and then 26 the year as the subclass, um, you know, that's up to you. Um, if you did have a, a subclass called Mad Hatter Ball 2016, which was a subclass of Mad Hatter Ball, you would just put in Mad Hatter Ball 2016. You wouldn't need to do any sort of, um, you know, indication that there was a class above it. So I call could call this uh, Toddler Fest that's, as my class and add it. So, pretty simple to do. Descript your code, which is kind of arbitrary. Your description, which does need to precisely match your accounting software, i.e. QuickBooks online, and then add. If you're not going to use it anymore, we can status it out, edit it, and if we haven't used it, delete it. Any questions about classes? Okay, so the really big one is chart of accounts. By the way, you might be seeing two other options here today, uh, discount code, promotion code, and expense groups. For time purposes, I am fairly certain we will not get that today. 
Um, but if we can, I will try. But I'm fairly certain we won't. Uh, if we do, it will probably have us going over time. But we'll just see how things run at the end. But they are cool concepts. For account classes, we have some slightly different. Once again, it is a line item configuration. And we'll ignore revenue source for just the time being. And it's configured much the way of classes. But your code is drawn from your accounting software. So QuickBooks uh, Desktop, I know had for sure. QuickBooks Online, I don't think as much. And I don't think other softwares like Xero, I don't know if they do it or not. But code is your chart of account number. So if your QuickBooks does have a chart of account number, you know, usually some system, uh, go ahead and put that in here. If it doesn't, make it up, I guess, what you'd want that code to have been. If you had, don't have chart of account numbers, it's totally up to you. Description is, once again, the same. Um, I'm not going to create one today. Is the same as classes. It is a precise match of the chart of account name or sub chart of account name in your uh, donate in, in your um, QuickBooks or other financial software. Um, so it has to match precisely. You don't need to kind of sub indicate. So if contributions has a sub bit for um, maybe grants, you don't need to build contributions colon grants. You would just put grants. So and then hit add. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But any questions about just adding the charter accounts? Okay. Great. So now we have classes and we have chart of accounts. We now get into building what I call a hierarchy of when they are applied. So what we're going to do is we're going to say under what circumstance does the system automatically apply a certain chart of accounts or class to a transaction. And it starts with a very broad uh, assignment and it gets progressively more narrow to the point where we're manually assigning it. So the first is actually here. We don't have this for class, but we have it for chart of accounts. So what we can say is for all gifts, this chart of account is assigned. For all event registrations, this chart of account is assigned. For all grants, this chart of account is assigned. And that's the beginning of our hierarchy. It's our revenue source. Now, there's some caveats here, and so this is you know may or may not get used. We cannot have two different sources assigned to the same chart of accounts, nor can we have a chart of accounts assigned to two different sources. I just said that. I didn't say that in reverse. That was the reverse of that. I can't have one chart. I can't have one revenue so source assigned to two different chart of accounts, and I can't have a chart of accounts assigned to more more than one gift source, revenue source. That's what I wanted to say. So it's always a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, if that doesn't work, we'll do all of our assignment later on and leave all of these empty. So, for example, if contributions is actually where grants and gifts go, then um, what I would probably do, actually in that particular scenario, I would assign grants um, to contributions, and then we can assign gift later on so that that works. Um, and, and so on. So any questions about this first level, this first layer? We're going to overwrite it in a minute. <laughs> okay, so that's our first layer. Now, obviously, that's not going to work perfectly because, like we saw, there could be cases where maybe two different types of things go to one, th uh, one um, um, chart of accounts, or maybe contributions has sub-chart of accounts where certain types of gifts go to it and uh, so on and so forth. So the next layer is what I call the program, program, program campaign layer, which will override the gift source. So as a reminder, so we're going to go back to configurations. Programs are basically donor intent. That's where the money is going, what the money is going to be used on. And campaign is your fundraising efforts. So as I mentioned, campaigns are most closely associated to classes. But programs are more closely associated to accounts because it's where the money's going. So what we could say, if, say, we edit or make a new program, and then we'll do, we'll show class, uh, campaign. So let's edit. Uh, so let's see here, the exhibition program. I'm going to edit that. So we might, for example... Yeah, actually, we did that here. So we have the contributions uh, chart of account, what all gifts are assigned to. However, 
by having this program assigned to exhibitions, it means, okay, all gifts will go to contributions, except for this program, which is actually going to have the money assigned to exhibitions. Now, one thing we need to remember about programs is we can assign both donations to a program, membership dues, and event registrations. So if any money at all is assigned to this program, no matter what its gift source, it will get this chart of accounts or account class. But normally, like I said, you don't have classes on the program level, but you might. And then we could have, you know, since we have sub-programs of this um, exhibitions fund, maybe we have sub-accounts of exhibitions for the different actual exhibitions, and then we could override on those levels, and so on and so forth. So program will override the source. Same with campaign. I'll just, for time purposes, skip going actually into a campaign, but it's going to look basically the same as this. And you could say, you know, anything assigned to a given campaign is going to have a specific class. Now, that's not to say that you can't have class assigned on program and, pro and account on, on campaign, but to kind of properly bridge it, I would probably say that most of the time program goes to chart of accounts and campaign goes to class. So... Any questions on that layer? Okay, so there's one more layer above this. And once again, it's getting more specific. It's the what I'd call the, the invoice item, the transaction item type layer. And this is gonna be the fund, the membership level, or the specific event. So if you edit an event, edit, edit a membership level or edit a fund, which is what we're gonna do here. We're not gonna do all three. There is the ability to say for this fund what the donation is, what kind of donation it is, and how you handle it, basically, like an event sponsorship, general donation, um, in-kind donations, things like that. You can state that for this fund, no matter what program it's assigned to, it's going to go to this chart of accounts. So, for example, if I used art supplies and I did assign that donation also to the program exhibitions, even though Exhibitions assigns it to the Exhibitions program, this fund is going to override that and set it back to Contributions. It's a weird example. You don't normally do that. And you, you know, for this example, I would not normally even bother with this because my gift source for all donations is already Contributions. But if, for example, you know, for whatever reason, due to the complexity, I could not have used uh, done the gift source on the chart of accounts itself, then all my funds would have some chart of account assigned. Part of me actually recommends doing your assignment on this level. It does require, for like events, a bit more data entry when you create your event, and your event staff will need to know what charter accounts to use, but this gives you the most control. But, anyhow, you'll see a chart of accounts and account class option in your membership levels under configuration. So if we went back into membership, membership levels, it's going to be there, and every time you create an event, you can set it from there as well. Any questions on this layer, which is effectively our last automatic layer? Okay, so at this point, we've seen that we can create our chart of accounts and our classes. For our chart of accounts, we can set the first layer saying that all types of money go to a certain chart of accounts. We've seen that in program and campaign, we can set the chart of accounts or class as needed. And then on the transaction level, on fund, membership level, or event, we can set the last automatic. The final option is on the financial screen where we can manually override the chart of account in class. So maybe we've got some weird exception where we need to manually change it, or we couldn't automate it for some reason, you know, it got just too complex. But by the way, if it's getting that complex, revisit your chart of accounts and classes because those should also, you know, simplicity is the key. You know, if it's so complex that it's basically spaghetti, uh, all interwoven and you can't make heads or tails of it, then it's probably not doing you any good and you might as well have had no chart of accounts. It's kind of my personal opinion or you no know, funds or what have you. So if it's all becoming complex spaghetti, revisit it, find a way to simplify it. But putting that aside, because it's just personal view, um, how can we manually change our chart of accounts in class? So here we actually have a bunch that's not assigned for whatever reason. So maybe for these toddler fests, for Adam Smith, we want to assign them to a given uh, accounting class. So assign accountant class after we select them. 
So we're going to do it with Event Fees and Toddler Fest. Save. And normally I would have probably done this on the event level. And we're all done. So, not refer. So, all set. There we go. Just had to give it a second. I was being impatient. And now I can do whatever I want with them. And uh, even if it's already been set, so that was an example where it's not set, whatever, I could change it. Um, any questions there? That's the last of our level of actually assigning accounts in classes. In a minute, we're going to actually play with them. All right, so now we're done with the configuration layer and assignment layer for accounts and classes. So where do they actually get used? Now, our first option is with um, our deposits, and the next is going to be with QuickBooks Sync. So what is this deposit feature? I call it, sometimes I call it bank reconciliation. What it lets you do is basically say these transactions are grouped together and went to the bank together. So, for example, if I go to the bank and I have four checks, you know, totaling $1,000, and I deposit them, what I'm going to see at my, in my bank you know, statement is $1,000 on the date. I don't know what's in that $1,000, and neither is your accountant. What this feature I'm about to show you lets you do is take those transactions, deposit them, quote-unquote, together, and group them together so that your, your accountant can say, oh, on this date, the bank shows $1,000. If I go into Tom uh, Fundly CRM, and I go and look at the deposits, deposited, I will see a $1,000 transaction on that day. I can go into it and see what's in that $1,000. So let's do that. Uh, let's, uh, let's run with Adam Smith. Let's see this three transaction we played with. Select, select, select. And I'm going to deposit them. So by depositing them, it doesn't actually remove it from the screen, just so you know, although it won't let you redeposit it. Uh, what it, what it, because this screen is also used for just general uh, assigning classes and accounts and, and review. But create deposit, deposit date. This should reconcile to the bank. Title uh, probably should be something. You know, let you give you a quick overview of what uh, is in it. So maybe event fees and then memo. This actually I'd probably recommend uh, if you did put a memo on your account on the transaction in your account, maybe you went online and did it or did it at the bank. I'm not sure if you can do it at the bank, but whatever. Um, I'd probably have this match with whatever memo you have in the bank. So toddler fest fees. We can view this in different ways. Default is by contact, by class, or by account. We'll make a difference here. We have a total of $15. Total funds, total adjustments, total that will show up in the deposit. What are adjustments? Adjustments are, well, what you think. They're changes. Sure, we have, let's pretend they're all checks. We have three checks for $5 each, um, but maybe we also had a little spare cash, like extra cash in our cash box from that event. And so I could make an adjustment for, um, say, extra cash from cash box and make it an adjustment of $5 and basically add in five dollars yeah and if it was negative that would take it out so now no, I always get that backwards excuse me we're going to add in five dollars so now our total deposit is 20 confirm deposit so now I have made my deposit and wait for it to catch up with me there we go and if I go to deposited transactions I can see that. I can view it. Ooh, put that aside for now, and uh, I can look into why well, there's a bit extra in here. But we'll put it aside for the time being. And I could, you know, show this to my accountant, and they can, they, or they can just log in and they can check and see what's uh, in that deposit. So, any questions about? Sure. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I have a question. Um, this is Tracy. Hey. Um, so would that also be the place where you would put in your PayPal fees? Well, fees are and a, yes, actually, yes. That's a good question. Or and not just, PayPal. It would be Stripe. We're PayPal now. We're converting to Stripe. But yes. But would that be where the Stripe fees would go? Yes, and I just also answered my question as why I had extra stuff in here. So we'll come back here. So, yeah, uh, if, so this, what we're seeing here is the original payment 
of the check. And then what you could do is you could add in as adjustments the credit card fees, for example. And how does um, how does that sync with QuickBooks? It does not. As far as it does not. So with so. Uh, and we'll talk about is, QuickBooks in a minute. Does something show but, up? At, okay. But um, what we are doing here, in no way, way, shape, or form, interacts with QuickBooks. So this particular this particular functionality is parallel to QuickBooks, but is not interacting with QuickBooks. So any adjustments I add here will not inter will mm -hmm. not affect any QuickBooks sync. This is purely for um, uh, purely for uh, just bank reconciliation, which brings me back to the point I missed and why we had extra transactions in here. These extra transactions are the other side. So I was totally skipping over that. Um, this is actually a $55 check that got applied. So if you have one reference number that got applied to two things, I've got to take that into account. So um, that's why there's more money in here than we saw previously. What we did was I selected transactions, but it goes, hey, there's another half to this, this payment, and it brought that payment in. And so that's why after, you know, after it deposited, it actually updated it to 120. And I wasn't clear, I, wasn't, uh, I didn't show that clearly previously, but that's why the amounts changed. In case anyone's wondering, uh, but yeah, this is if you did when you actually brought the you know the stuff hit the bank, it was less than the, what you originally got from the donor, for example. You could put in as adjustments your credit card fees, processing fees, what have you, so that you know of that hundred bucks, only ninety five hit the bank, and your accountant goes, where is it? Where's five bucks missing? You can go, oh, no, no, it's right there. It's it's credit card fees. So that's usually where you probably actually have your accountant possibly using this. Um, it's up to you. It's a cool feature, and I just like to make sure everybody knows about it. But okay. Any other questions about the f deposit functionality before we move into QuickBooks? Okay. So let's talk about QuickBooks. So one thing I do want to mention: to do the deposit functionality, we don't have to have an account in class assigned. But in order to sync a transaction to QuickBooks, an account in class must. Oh, excuse me, account must be assigned. We don't have to have a class, excuse me. Class is optional, but account must be assigned because we can't sync it into QuickBooks without an account. They make us, they require it. So how do we set up the sync? And then we'll go through the nitpicky details a little bit more on how the sync works. Well, it's really simple. And this is that five minute piece I talked about. QuickBooks sync, get started. There's some boilerplate here that you want to review. Confirm, I agree. This will pop up, connect to QuickBooks and then log into your QuickBooks account. Once, quick, once Intuit gives me that, you can the screen, they're being a bit slow. Come on, Intuit. There we go. There we go. And then just put your username and password, sign in, and it's done. You're now synced. So you, as we saw, that most of the syncing process itself is really just configuring your accounts and classes, setting up automatic, you know, when accounts and classes are set up, set automatically, and then manually, uh, you know, modifying your um, you know, accounts and classes as needed. The actual setting up the sync, as we saw, is what, three minutes, not even that. So um, where the real questions come in is what is and isn't synced? Well, at this time, per my understanding, if there is a account assigned to the transaction, financial transaction, it is synced. So anything that's not got an account is not synced. It is, I believe, synced as an invoice with payment details, a customer is created as needed. If the chart of accounts doesn't exist, it is created by QuickBooks, so that's why they need to max, max, match precisely. I'm not sure what cleanup side they have on there. The donation name, event name, membership level is given as the item name. Um, and uh, what have you. Ex and I have recently learned... Excuse me. Yeah. Can you, can you repeat that? What did you say is is equivalent to the item number? The item name is. Uh, I the, mean the item name. The item name uh, from your item list is the f name of the fund, event name, okay. or membership level name. And then the the contact is now becomes a customer. So, and uh, okay, I thank believe you. the sync runs every. F Five minutes, although I'm feeling a little hazy on that. We have a couple of different syncs that run at different times, but I believe that one's every five minutes. Or maybe that was every hour. 
it's pretty real time. Um, so beyond that, most everything else is handled from the QuickBooks side. There was once a question that came up that I do like to point out of, well, what if I'm also synced with my bank? And so I'm having credit card transactions come from both bank and from Quick and from non-pro and Fundly CRM. In that case, and I don't know how to do it, but there is the option on the um, on the um, on the QuickBooks side to say what transactions come from what sources. And so uh, what sometimes people will do is they'll turn off the income from their bank and only keep the expenses and so on and so forth. So that kind of stuff you will need to look to on the QuickBooks side. I sadly can't advise on anything on the QuickBooks side. Um, I had a very brief time when I had access to it, but because it's a paid service, I don't have ongoing access to QuickBooks. Um, and beyond that, Really, it's just a matter of getting your accounts and classes assigned correctly for the transactions on our side. Any questions about QuickBooks Sync? I'm sure there are, but... Um, okay. Well, if you do have any questions, there's always support at funny.com. Technically, we're at the hour. I'm feeling a little uh, like I want to get this on a recording since that's what I'm doing right now. So uh, for those of you interested, I am about to talk about promotion codes and discount codes and expenses, which are primarily used for things like appeals and events. Um, so if you're not interested, go ahead and move on. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to uh, push forward for those probably about 10 to 15 minutes. So there is functionality. You may have seen it when we were working on invoices. There is a field for discount or promotion codes, and they work exactly like you might think they are. They're basically coupons codes, specifically for memberships and events. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you how to create those, and then very quickly, you know, I'll point out again where you uh, use them, although I'm probably, for time purposes, not going to use one. So discount promo codes under financials in configuration, which we get to from the main menu. And uh, we have a couple different options when creating a discount code. So we're going to see those. So here I have some of my existent ones. Let's add a new discount code. So start with the discount code promo code. This is the actual code. So um, alphanumeric, capitalization matters. So I recommend you do either all caps or all lower, depending on your style. I actually kind of like the all caps methodology. It's very clear and bold and a lot easier to not get things confused, but it's up to you. So let's do a, uh, let's, in our particular one, let's do one that is only applicable to a particular event. So we'll call this the Toddler Fest, you know, 10, uh, 5. I'll tell you why I did that and the way I did. So first we put in our code, Toddler Fest 5. Then we say, is this a flat number or a percentage? So I do a flat number, and I'm going to say 5, the amount that is taken off. If I did percentage, it would take off 5%. I forget if it rounds up or down, but I suspect down. Um, so I'm going to use $5. And the reason I put the 5 in here is in case I had many different codes for Toddler Fest, this tells me what it actually does. So just a good nomenclature I like. You don't have to use it. If this was like just 5 bucks off any event, maybe I'd just call it Event 5. Um, the other flip of, you know, I made this nice and predictable for staff, but that also means that it theoretically is predictable by users, i.e. contacts. So you got to kind of trust your folk not to try and get finagly, but theoretically, if you do have a system like this, if they learn one code, they could theoretically learn a better code and use that when they shouldn't. It's up to you, but I like a nice simple coding system. So Toddler Fest, $5 off, description for your purposes, not required. When is the code going to effect? When does it leave effectiveness, which I don't believe is required? No, it is required. I lied. So let's say it's going to last uh, until August 1st and started, so we can backdate stuff with it at the beginning of July. And then the limit usage per person. So a given registrant can use it how many times? Once. So this basically gives them a free ticket. Um, and then how, what is the total limit on usage? So as many people as I have it can use it, or only like 10 people can use it, and they can only use it once. Let's see if it's unlimited. 
So this basically gives anyone who has this code one free adult ticket. And then what event membership or membership renewal does it apply to, which can include all. But let's do selected, select event, Toddler Fest 2016. By the way, this is, a, you might notice sometimes I recommend always put the year for an event that may happen multiple years. This is why, it is why. if I had Toddler Fest 2015 and 2016, I know which year is which. If I have just Toddler Fest and two of them, I have no idea which year it's for. So, kind of goes back to a different webinar. And that's that. Save. I now have a coupon code, Toddler Fest 5, that I can use for event registration. So now if I go, create an invoice. So let's create it for myself. And now I basically can get one adult in for free. So let's run through, let's run really quick, and then we'll go into expenses, which also, by the way, are primarily used for events. So Eric, create for today, event, toddler fest registration, quantity, two adults, one toddler, because it's all I got right now. Give me another two years, I have another one. Is that a year now? What is it? I guess it's like when they start toddling. So maybe about a year. Save. Adds our item. Toddler Fest 5. Apply coupon. And it took $5 off. So now I only owe $5. These are reportable, by the way. I've uh, recently built a report that can uh, pull up uh, discounts and codes and stuff like that. So, and then we receive payment like normal. Check five dollars, transaction ID, uh, all that fun stuff. Receive payment. I have other debts, but we ignore them. So that's discount codes. Any questions? <laughs> so that's discount codes. The next piece is expense groups. So we're gonna. This one's gonna be pretty quick. It's mostly used for events, but you can use it in the appeals module for tracking the costs on appeal. I'm going to focus my example on events since appeals is a paid add-on that most people probably don't have. Uh, but it's really cool. Um, so we'll put that aside for another day. Financials, expense groups. So what are expense groups? Well, expense groups are basically categories of expenses. So this could possibly reconcile with a chart of accounts expense. Uh, chart of accounts in QuickBooks. Uh, and then we have expense items, which would be, well, the items, the expense items breakdown of maybe, you know, exactly what you spent on. So create a new chart of expense group, add new expense group like any other ad on the system. And uh, let's borrow uh, event, the catering, let's borrow catering. Edit. So give it a code, a name, it's active. And then we create our expense items. So here I have catering flat fee, and per person. So what is this? Well, the description is what is the actual line item. You know, if this was an expense, what is the line item? So catering flat fee would represent, you know, if you have a catering, so, okay, let me back up a bit. So catering is all the pay, everything you'd pay together for an event to put have it catered. And there's gonna be different expenses. So for my example, Let's say our caterer charges, uh, has two components to their charges. One is a flat fee. Just by using them, you have to pay them a certain amount, X. And then they charge you per person on top of that. And we can handle that with the cost for option for each item. So total cost is the flat fee. Per person, per piece technically, is for every registration attendee on the event, we add one to our per person. And then percentage is just the percentage of the uh, revenue for the event. Rarely used, maybe if you had uh, an expense item uh, for maybe a um, consultant or event coordinator or someone like that that took a percentage. But so we have per, per we have total cost and per piece, and then we just create as many expense items for that category as we need. So that's how you configure them. I'll go ahead and show you how to use them. So let's go to an event. and we'll actually see it in play. And then we'll be done for the day. So let's borrow Toddler Fest. Click on the name. So this goes a little bit into the event webinar. 
Uh, I don't normally cover this in the webinar, that webinar in depth. So uh, for those of you who do play with events, this is going to be of interest to you. Um, so track expenses, select your group, catering, and what is your cost? So this is a small event. Catering is quite light. We're really just providing a snack for everybody. So the caterer does ask that we give them 500 bucks as a flat fee and then charges us maybe $2 a person for a, for, a, for a snack. Maybe they're giving us a better deal than normal, what have you. And our vendor, so who is the caterer? So this could be, you know, whatever the name of the caterer is. So let's use this one. Arjun's Turkey Sandwiches is doing the catering. And save. So now what this will do for our event is it will add expenses. Oh, excuse me, I want the dashboard of the event. So now we have 500 plus, what was it, $2 per everybody who's registered. I have 12, so they added $24. And so currently, so if it's 500 plus 24 is my expenses. I've only made 35. I'm currently negative on the event. So kind of the expense, the financial side of events. But that's event, uh, that's um, expense groups and at least one application of them. The other one, as I mentioned, is when you create appeals, which is far beyond the scope of this webinar. So that's everything I've got um, on financial.